major concepts in this lesson. The first is the idea of organization and how tissues build organs to systems. So we'll look at some of those major body tissues. That's number one. Then we'll look at an organ system, the skin. That's number two. And then we'll see a little more about this idea of homeostasis and how the skin helps regulate homeostasis in the body. So we'll try to incorporate that idea of homeostasis into this system. Let's take a look at how this works. This organization of the body, how tissues, organs, systems are all going to be working together to help maintain homeostasis in ever-changing conditions. Because here you are one minute, you're sweating, maybe a minute or two later, you might be cold and shivering, and your body is going through all kinds of different changes and all kinds of changing environments, and yet the internal conditions of the body stay relatively the same. So let's take a look at some of these tissues. There's four major kinds of tissues, epithelial, connective, muscular, and nervous. Epithelial is by far the largest, most confusing, because there's lots of different kinds. Connective is probably the next most confusing because, again, there's lots of different kinds of connective tissue. Muscular is not too bad. There's only a few kinds of muscular tissue. And nervous isn't so bad because there's not a whole lot in the way of nervous tissue. Let's take a look at some of these examples of epithelial tissue. First, we can look at the shape of the cells, and then we can look at how those cells are arranged. And that helps us to categorize epithelial tissues, the tissues that cover and line. So these tissues will cover organs, they'll line organs, and they're going to be arranged in one of a couple ways. They might look like this, where they're flat and squished. That cell shape helps us to remember the type of tissue that is squamous, squished, squamous. This type looks like a cube, and that might help us to remember that type of tissue, cuboidal. And then there's this type of tissue here that looks like a column, like a long column. And that might help us remember that tissue or that cell shape, columnar, or columnar. So squished, squamous, cube-shaped, cuboidal, like a column, columnar, or columnar. Now we get to see how those tissues are arranged. So three major kinds, squamous, cuboidal, columnar, and then they're arranged in different ways. So let's see how they're arranged. Either there's just one layer, and that's called simple. So simple squamous, simple columnar, simple cuboidal, just one layer of those cells. Or they're stacked up. So in this case, they are stratified. So they're in strata, they're stacked up in these layers. Stacked up in these layers. So it's either going to be simple or stratified, and it's going to be one of these three types. Now these are going to be different places. So stratified and squamous tissue might be your epidermis. Simple squamous might be lining your lungs so that that air can exchange through that thin membrane. You might have a columnar in places like your digestive tract. You might have um, cuboidal lining tubes in your kidneys. So these are all places where this tissue covers and lines it's either going to be simple, cuboidal, or columnar, and those cells are either going to be arranged in one layer, simple, or they're going to be arranged in stacks of layers, stratified. Connected tissue is categorized this way. Either it's connective tissue that's proper, or connective tissue that's specialized. Connective tissue is a tissue that's holding your body together. And there's two main parts to the connective tissue. There's a matrix, that's usually protein, and then there's the cells. So the cells are surrounded by this matrix around it. So it's not necessarily one cell is close to another cell. It's one cell and then this surrounding matrix. And depending on the nature of that matrix kind of helps us categorize the type of tissue. 
So here we have a cell, and then around it is matrix. Same with bone cells, except in that case, the matrix is very hard. Or in blood cells, where the cells aren't touching at all, but the matrix is fluid. So those are all specialized, those are specialized connective tissues. Things like cartilage and bone and blood. The other kind of, of connective tissue, connective tissue proper, are things like adipose tissue, where we store our fat, or things like tendons and ligaments, which connect muscles to muscles or bone to bone. Muscle tissue is only three kinds. There's only three different kinds of muscle tissue. There's the voluntary kind of muscle tissue that's stratified with these lines because the cells have the, that kind of straight shape to them. So the stratified, which is the voluntary kind of muscle, the muscle you can control. Cardiac muscle, which is kind of similar because it also has the stripes, but you can't control your cardiac muscle directly. And then there's smooth muscle, which doesn't have any of the stripes. It's also involuntary. So these two are involuntary. These two have stripes, like or striations. This is voluntary muscle, involuntary muscle, striated muscle, smooth muscle. But cardiac muscle is unique, and it's only found in one place in the body, and that's your heart. Nerve tissue is fairly easy to handle. There's only really two kinds. There's the neurons, the actual nerve cells, and then the supportive neuroglial cells that kind of help to uh, protect, surround, and uh, help the nerve cells to thrive and survive. So there's a nerve cell. You find those mostly in your brain spinal cord. These are like actual slides, microscope slides, and pictures of those slides of different tissue types that you might experience or see in a laboratory setting in a pretty typical anatomy class. But here's where you're looking. If it's epithelial tissue, you're looking for the tissue that covers and lines. So in this case, here's a tube in a kidney. Here's the lining of that tube. So these cells are cube-shaped, one layer. So simple, cuboidal, epithelial, they cover and line. Here's a layer of cells that are lining your body. That's your epidermis. These cells are squished. So that would be squamous. And because they're in lots of layers, it's going to be stratified. So stratified, squamous, epithelium. Here's another layer that's covering and lining. These are also squished. But in this case, there's just a single layer. So it's simple. Simple, squamous, that would be like this right here as well. Simple squamous epithelium. When I look at this tissue, we'll notice how we have some cells, but they're not directly connecting. There's a matrix in between them. So that's a good picture of adipose tissue. Right, so that's connective tissue proper. All right, connective tissue proper, adipose tissue. Here again are some cells that are covering and lining. In this case, Notice they're kind of column-shaped cells. So in that case, columnar, simple columnar. These cells here aren't touching. There's matrix in between. So again, connective tissue proper. Uh, bone cells are connective tissue, but they're specialized. So here's a cell over here, the space where the cell would be. And there's this matrix in between those cells. It's a solid matrix. It's so a bone connective tissue that's specialized, in this case, solid. Blood is connective tissue, like here's a cell, here's a cell, here's a cell. The matrix in between is fluid, so connective tissue, again, it's specialized. These are pictures of muscle cells. So notice here the striations, which tells me that that's voluntary skeletal muscle, the muscle you find around your skeleton. These branches here and stripes kind of lead me to notice that that's cardiac muscle. This, no stripes, is smooth muscle, muscle that you can't control. So it's going to be around your digestive tract. Picture of a nerve cell. So that's nervous tissue. So there's a basic body tissue. Your body's going to consist of those tissues. Now, 
In your body, you also have body cavities, and it's these cavities that the tissues often are located in or around, covering or lining or located inside. You have two major body cavities. The front cavity, which we call the ventral cavity, and then the back cavity, the cavity in the back of your body, we call that the dorsal cavity. So dorsal and ventral are your two big body cavities. The ventral cavity we can divide into two major cavities. The thoracic, which is your chest area, and abdominal, which is below your diaphragm. Same thing with the back cavity. We can divide that into two major cavities. The cranial, where your brain would be, and then your spinal, where your spinal cord would be. So those two cavities. So let's take a look at how we can divide the thoracic cavity up, this chest cavity. Where the lungs are located, we'll call that pleural. And where the heart's located, we'll call that pericardium. These two cavities are divided by the diaphragm. So this cavity down here, abdominal cavity. Look at the dorsal cavities then. Cranial for your brain, spinal going down your back. Here again, the ventral cavities, the front cavities, the thoracic and abdominal. Now, of these two cavities, which do you think is the most protected? Which is the most protected by your body? So when we look at the ventral cavity, we see the ribs are connecting the thoracic part. We see that the abdominal part, though, is kind of exposed. The skull protects the cranial cavity. The spinal column connects or protects the spinal cavity. But the abdominal cavity is the only one that's really unprotected by bone. So the dorsal cavity, very well protected compared to the ventral cavity by your skeletal system. We also have some membranes that are located around our body, four major kinds of membranes. These membranes usually produce something, and the, something they produce typically goes along with the name of the membrane. So for example, the mucus membrane produces mucus, it's going to line cavities that open to the outside of the body, like your nose, your throat and that will help collect dirt and dust particles, and we call those boogers. So the mucus and that mucus lining serves that purpose. Serous um, membranes are going to line cavities and organs. So when you're moving around, you're slouching and slumping, and your body's going one way or the other, the organs in your body are also kind of moving around. But you don't ever notice, and it's not a big deal, because this serous membrane allows those those organs to slide around past each other, and uh, you don't really feel it, it doesn't make a difference. Synovial membranes are located in joints, and they allow your joints to move with ease, and they produce synovial fluid, serous fluid, serous membranes, mucus, synovial fluid, and synovial joints, like elbows and knees, or synovial joints. Cutaneous membrane basically forms your skin. So take a look at some of these body cavities. Let's see if they're dorsal or ventral. All right, so the abdominal cavity, dorsal or ventral. All right, so that's going to be in the front. Spinal cavity, that's going to be in the back. Pericardial cavity, that's a subdivision of the thoracic cavity. The thoracic cavity is also ventral. Cranial is dorsal. Pleural is where your lungs are, so that will also be your body is made up of 11 different body systems. These systems are made up of those tissues and organs, and those organs all serve different functions, and the system has different functions. But let's take a look at some of these body systems. In this case, let's see what some of these body systems do and what they're like. So, protection, touch sensation, that sounds like the integumentary system, your skin, oil glands, sweat glands. Movement, the only cells that can contract, and that's the muscular system. Immunity has a lot to do with your lymphatic system, where your lymph nodes and uh, lymph vessels will help monitor your body for infections. Protection and support sounds like your skeletal system. Gas exchange sounds like your respiratory system, bringing oxygen in, getting carbon dioxide out. Nutrients and waste sounds like your digestive and urinary system. Takes care of those things. Regulate and control sounds like your nervous and endocrine system. Your nervous system regulates things really quickly. 
through nerve impulses, your endocrine system regulates things slowly through the hormones. And the cardiovascular system is how your body transports things internally, things like blood and water and all the other stuff in your veins pumped by your heart, but transported around by the cardiovascular system. Now, which system is missing? Have you thought of it yet? The only system missing there is the reproductive system. And it's probably the one system that we could live without. Like you, you could live without your reproductive system and survive. Any of these other systems actually wouldn't make it a day like without the system. So what are some functions of your skin? As we move to this second part when we're talking about the uh, integumentary system, what are some functions? What are some jobs? What does your skin do? Well, primarily it's going to serve to protect. That is, to keep things out of your body that don't belong. Bacteria, dirt, all kinds of viruses, things that your skin encounters often, but it prevents from actually getting into and damaging your internal organs. So protection is one major thing that your integumentary system does. Also, it helps to prevent water loss. Interestingly, one of the major problems with burn victims is dehydration. That's the number one concern of the ER. Not so much bacterial infections, although that might be a bad one. It's actually the preventing of water loss. That's the primary concern. Because skin is waterproof. It helps keep water in. It also helps keep water out. So when you're sitting in the bathtub, water is not going to be seeping in through your skin. Your skin is waterproof. It will keep it out. But it also prevents water loss. Like it keeps water in your body. It keeps you from dehydrating. Thermal regulation means it helps to regulate your body's temperature. So you sweat. That evaporates. Your body temperature goes down. You shiver, and uh, the erector pili muscles contract, and your hair stands up and traps some of that warm air. And it helps maintain your body temperature. Blood vessels that are interacting with the skin, like when you're nervous or embarrassed, you turn red as those blood vessels that dilate and allow blood to come to the surface. And you're embarrassed, and you feel that heat flash. All of those are ways that your skin helps to regulate your body's temperature, thermal regulation. And then when you're exposed to some sunlight, your skin can help make and synthesize vitamin D. Also, um, your skin helps to sense things. Uh, pressure, touch, pain, heat, cold, all those sense things are associated with your skin. Excretion just means to get rid of waste. And when you sweat, you can get rid of some waste products through your sweat. So your skin helps with excretion. Here are some of the major parts that are associated with skin, some of the structures that are associated with it. Notice first, the epidermis is this upper layer of skin. Dermis is this major lower layer. dermis is this layer of mostly adipose tissue. We call that the hypodermis. So if you had a hypodermic needle, you should expect the hypodermic needle to go through all those layers of skin. Notice a few other things. This epidermis layer has mostly dead skin cells. The bottom part of the epidermis layer are the living skin cells. As those living skin cells are being pushed up by new cell division. They fill with a protein called keratin that eventually kills the cell but creates this waterproof layer on the top of the skin. Under that is the dermal layer. All this right here is the dermis. It's this shape here of the dermal layer that makes things like your fingerprints. So your fingerprints are permanent because it's these cells up here that are growing multiplying, dividing, and then falling off, and we call that dust around our house. But all this layer under here is permanent. So here, this dermal layer is what makes things like fingerprints. It's also where, if you were going to get a tattoo, that's where the tattoo ink would go, because if we put the ink up here, those skin cells would fall off and it would be gone forever. 
if we put the ink down here, this layer doesn't change, that dermal layer, and so that tattoo remains permanent. You can see that in this dermal layer we have the root of the hair, here's the shaft of it, but down here we have the root of the hair. Normally that hair is going to be connected to a, a nerve ending, which is why when you pull on hair it hurts, but when you cut hair, it doesn't hurt because the hair itself is just dead cells filled with keratin. But down here is where the nerve is, and so that's where you actually feel it. You also notice that an oil, sometimes called sebaceous gland, is associated with that hair follicle. And that, that oil is going to help keep that hair lubricated and help keep it pliable. But sometimes that oil gland gets blocked up, and when it does, we call that acne. You'll also notice that there's some nerve endings here in the dermal layer, different kinds of nerve endings, some pressure, heat, touch sensations. You'll notice that if you scrape the top of your skin, no blood, because there's no blood vessels. But down here in the hypodermis area, where you can see some of the major blood vessels, is where you're, you're going to get most of the bleeding. So if you were to cut yourself shaving and it bleeds for a while, then you've probably cut into the hypodermis layer. You'll also notice it's a rectal pili muscle which pulls on the hair follicle, which makes the hair kind of stand up on end. If you have your skin surface rubbed constantly, then this rate of cell division will go up and you'll get a thicker epidermal layer. We often call those calluses. You notice about the oil glands and acne is that when those oil glands get clogged, that's what's going to eventually cause what we call blackhead. And then if it gets infected and some white blood cells get there and start dying as they destroy the oil and the bacteria, and uh, we call that pus, but there's just dead white blood cells. But one thing to notice is that those, um, that, that condition, those zits, aren't caused by dirt or particles or oil on the skin surface. They're caused inside. So acne isn't caused by anything you eat. Don't worry. So you can eat chocolate and you'll be okay. Acne isn't caused by whether your face is dirty or whether you sleep with your face in your pillow or anything like that. It's caused by internal things, the production of oil and that gland getting clogged. So let's take a look at some parts to the skin. Here we have the hair, the shaft right there, follicle down here. Here we have the associated oil or sebaceous gland. Here we have some temperature receptors, the nerve endings in that dermis layer. Down here we have the erector pili muscle that can make our hair stand up on end. Deep below the skin we have adipose tissue, fat cells that help insulate the skin, help provide cushion and support as well as some energy. We have blood vessels that are deep uh, below that surface so that they're protected. We have a sweat gland, which can help, again, cool us off in this upper epidermis layer. So what is associated with what? Like what words would be associated with the epidermis? Which ones would be associated with the dermis? Which one would have a little bit of overlap? So if we're looking at layers of epithelial cells, that's clearly going to be the epidermis. When we look at skin that has, or the parts of skin that have no blood vessels, avascular, that's also epidermis. When we're looking at where cells divide rapidly, that's in the epidermal area. When we look at being filled with this protein called keratin, that's primarily going to be in the epidermis, although keratin is present in most skin cells. But the epidermis layer is also dead skin cells. The dermis is where you're going to have some connective tissue because you're connecting those layers together. It is going to be vascular. There are going to be blood vessels there. It is going to be more permanent. That's why we put tattoos into the dermal layer. Fingerprints, we can count on them. In the dermis layer is where you have mostly collagen and elastin. These two proteins that help keep the skin like flexible, movable. Like you can move it around a little bit. It goes back to the same uh, basic place. This elastic. A stretch mark if you're growing too fast and you get a and you get a tear in your dermal layer that tends to stick around for a while. We call it stress marks because that dermal layer is more permanent. And uh, wrinkles are often associated with this dermis layer. 
And that's because um, the skin has lost a lot of its elasticity. It doesn't stretch and return back to where it usually went. <laughs> now there's an extra skin kind of bowled up around it, wrinkles. So which layer would have nerves? Definitely the dermal layer does, which causes fingerprints, the dermal layer. And uh, beauty creams, do they really work? So sometimes people, will, you'll see them rubbing beauty creams on their face or on their arm. They're trying to moisturize their skin and all these things. Well, remember that skin is waterproof. So those creams aren't typically getting past the epidermal layer. So skin kind of creates that barrier. There are some things about the creams that can help them penetrate the skin layers, but typically that those Ex, the epidermal, those upper skin cells filled with keratin, create a layer that keeps things out, especially if it's water soluble. So what's a loose layer of connective tissue? That's what the hypodermis is. Mostly, um, mostly adipose tissue. And in this case, it's called loose connective tissue because the cells are far from each other, so loose connected tissue, as opposed to dense connected tissue, which would be more like your tendons and ligaments, or dense uh, connected tissue proper. It does create a layer of protection and insulation, so by having that little bit of layer of fat underneath your skin, it helps to keep your body temperature insulated, as well as protect you from impact especially. So if you're in being injected with a hypodermic needle, it's going to go into the hypodermic layer, through the epidermis, through the dermis, into the hypodermis. And if you get liposuction, it's only good to remove a few pounds, just a, few, a little bit of fat that's stored underneath the skin. So mostly it's used for reshaping your body, for changing the, the shape that your body has, not for taking off a whole lot of pounds. The problem is that they take all that tissue. So fat can't be stored in that adipose tissue anymore. So if fat cannot return to that area, it might be stored other places, let's say in your abdominal or close to your internal organs, which can actually be more devastating to your health, though it might not look as bad to your appearance. So which body cavity holds the lungs? It's the pleural cavity. Which body cavity is the most protected? It's the cranial cavity. Which body system is the most unique? And that's going to be the reproductive system, mostly because you only have half of a reproductive system. All the other systems, you have the whole thing. You can eat, and you don't need any help. You can breathe, and you don't need any help. But with the reproductive system, you only have half the system, either the male half or the female half. And it's unique in that the only time it's a complete system is during intercourse, where those two systems become one. which is not associated with the dermis. So that's going to be mostly the keratin. And where do men typically store fat? For men, it's around the abdomen. For girls, it's more around your hips. So guys are apples, girls are pears. So in this case for men, typically around the abdomen. When we think of skin, probably the first thing that comes to our mind is skin color. And there are several things that affect skin color. So we're going to try to rank them from most important to least important. So one of the things, probably the biggest influence on skin, probably the most important thing about skin, is your melanocytes. These cells that are located in the dermal layer that are helping produce epidermal cells produce this a pigment called melanin. And the melanin makes the skin darker or lighter or yellow or red or whatever color it happens to be. That which gives you your skin pigment. So that's going to be the primary thing that determines your skin color. Now we all have the same basic number of melanocytes. It's just some melanocytes are working harder, which makes them more black or darker black. And some don't work quite as hard. We don't have the DNA for that. And we might look lighter in color. Then your exposure to sunlight has a dramatic impact on your skin color because those ultraviolet light penetrates the skin, stimulating the melanocytes to produce more melanin to try to use that protein as a protection from the ultraviolet light. So whenever you go visit a tanning bed, 
what your body's doing is trying to protect you from the ultraviolet light causing cancer. So you, in your head, you're thinking, I'm going to the tanning bed so I can look good. Your body's thinking, I need to build up some protection from killing myself, this uh, ultraviolet light that can cause cancer. And you do have some other things like your circulation or blood flow that affect your skin temperature. So for example, when you're afraid, your skin might drain and you look pale or white. When you're tired, you might get dark circles under your eyes because that dark blood is pooling in those capillaries that are close to the skin and uh, you look like you have dark circles under your eyes. Or when you're cool, you might look blue. Or if you have some circulation problems, uh, your fingers or nose might look uh, cold or different colors. So blood flow does have an impact on your skin color as well. Hair is basically dead cells. Cells filled with keratin and are formed here in the follicle and then pushed up so that's hair growth. So when we cut the hair, it's just dead cells. We don't feel it. When we pull the hair, then we feel the nerve ending here in the root and follicle um, and that we actually feel. Where do we have hair? Well, over most of our body. There are a few places where we don't have it, like our lips typically don't have hair, or the palms of our hands, the soles of our feet don't have hair. And hair does help uh, protect us some, like you think about your hair in your head from warmth, but also uh, it creates another little bit of a layer uh, to prevent things like bacteria from getting onto our skin or small um, microorganisms from getting into our skin. So it does create a little bit of a layer of protection. Fingernails are also made up of dead skin cells. They're filled with keratin and they uh, and collagen, uh, so they're uh, hard, but they, they provide pretty much a protective cover over the sensitive nerve endings in our fingertips. So our fingertips are filled with nerve endings, which would be really painful every time we touch something, except that our fingernails kind of help to uh, provide some armor plating, some protection for those, those sensitive area of our fingertips. Oil glands, again, are found all over the body. They help keep our skin pliable and flexible, which is kind of ironic because we use very abrasive cleaners sometimes to try to get rid of all that oil on our skin. Then we complain that our skin is all dried up and cracking, so we add moisturizers, which is what the oil does originally anyway. But they're found all over the body, and if the duct gets clogged from the inside, that's how we get acne. Sweat glands produce sweat. The sweat helps to cool our body and regulates our body temperature. So when we're running and hustling and uh, we start to sweat, it's our body's way of cooling itself. And uh, in the ear, we have wax glands, but wax glands are just modified sweat glands. So it's a sweat gland in the ear that's slightly modified to produce wax as opposed to sweat. The third main concept is this idea of homeostasis, regulating the internal body condition. So we take whatever that internal body condition is, if it gets too high or too low, then it's picked up by some nerve ending, a sensor, that sent a message to our brain. sends a message to an effector, a muscle or a gland. That effector then does something to restore the balance. So for example, if you're hot and your body temperature rises, that gets picked up by a nerve ending, sends a message to a brain, we're hot. The brain sends a message to a muscle or gland. This time, it's the sweat gland. The muscles are the blood vessels, so they uh, dilate, blood moves to the surface of our skin, all that heat gets dissipated by the sweat as the sweat evaporates and hopefully our body temperature returns back to normal. That's homeostasis in a nutshell, how it works. So there's some ways that we might think about like how can the skin help us maintain our internal body temperature. So we talked about sweating, uh, we talked about hair, we talked about the blood vessels in there, so there's all kinds of different ways that our skin can help us maintain our internal or constant body temperature. So one thing is hair helps to trap the air close by for insulation. Also vasoconstriction, that means the blood vessel is getting smaller. Vasodilation means the blood vessel is getting wider. So now blood going toward our skin, blood moving away from our skin and into our more important organs. 
and then sledding across to help cool us down. Let's take a look at what this vasoconstriction means. Vasoconstriction means that these superficial vessels are kind of pinched off and blood gets diverted to the deeper organs. That way, the surface might feel cold, but the internal organs maintain a constant temperature that keeps us nice and warm. In the case of vasodilation, now the blood is diverted to the surface, away from the internal organs. This allows that heat to dissipate when it helps us to sweat more, and uh, that heat gets out of our body and the internal organs stay cooler. There are some other things that our skin does to help maintain our body's homeostasis. One is that our skin is going to turn red uh, at sites of inflammation. So when we're injured, the place kind of swells, our skin stretches to accommodate that, and as all that blood is moving to that area, it turns red, it might even feel hot because of all that blood going to that area. But it lets us know there's a problem there, that there's an irritation, there's an inflammation in that area, and that's one of the functions for skin, help just maintaining our body, keeping our body normal. Our skin has these, like, a grain to it, kind of like wood has a grain. Our skin has these contour lines, like lines of uh, the way the proteins are oriented in our skin. So that if we were to get a cut that's parallel to one of those lines, then it can heal easily and typically doesn't leave much of a scar. If we get a cut or scrape that's perpendicular to those lines, then we can pretty much count on some scarring in that area. So this is a drawing of what some of those contour lines look like in the skin. And you can imagine a big cut going up and down your back would leave some scarring, whereas one that goes with these contour lines would not cause as much scarring. Calluses and corns are just areas where your skin has been rubbed and rubbed and rubbed and rubbed and rubbed. And as a response, because that's what homeostasis does, it just responds, but as a response, the skin cell division has gone up. Like the, as a response of all that, to all that rubbing, the rate of skin cell division has gone up. So the skin divides more rapidly, we get things like calluses and corns, which sometimes we appreciate, sometimes we want to get rid of. Burns kind of follow like these layers of skin. So a first degree burn pretty much just targets the epidermal layer, just that layer is affected. A second degree burn is characterized by blisters, and that's going to affect not just the upper layer, but this dermal layer, the second layer of skin. A third degree burn is going to go through all the skin and affect the tissues underneath. So that's going to be the most severe kind of burn. A lot of times what happens is because of that burn, our skin starts to peel. And that's just our body's way of trying to get rid of those dead skin cells, especially if they've been exposed to so much ultraviolet light that they have a high propensity for cancer. So it's a defense mechanism of your body to help just peel those uh, skin cells off. Second degree burns, blistering. First degree burns, redness. Third degree burns, black. So if you're just looking at someone, that's what you're looking for. But which burn will be the most painful? So a first degree burn might, be, might seem to be bad, but you have to remember there's no nerve endings in that epidermal layer, so we don't really feel it. A second degree burn is burning into these nerve endings, so we do feel it really badly. A third degree burn has burned those nerve endings up, so we don't feel it anymore. There's no feeling left. So the most painful kind of burn, second degree burn. But the more serious kind of burn is a third degree burn because now our skin isn't performing its functions mostly for protection from bacteria or dehydration. The rule of nine is just a quick, easy way to see like how much of a body is burned. So 10% of your body is burned, how do you know that? 30% of your body is burned, how can you possibly tell? So the rule of nine is just a quick way to evaluate how much of a body is burned. So you take your body, divide it into 11 different segments, because 9 times 11 is 99, and the leftover segment is just going to be 1%. So your whole head, that's 9% of your skin, right there in your head, 9%. Your arm is 9%, your other arm is 9%. For your chest, 9% for your abdomen, the whole part, 18%. Same with your back, 18 for your back. 
The front of your leg, 9%. The front of the other leg, 9%. The back of the leg is 9%. The back of the other leg is 9%. So count it out. So this is 1, 2 for an arm, 3 for an arm, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So that's 99%. And your groin is the last 1%. So if you worked at a pizza place and you stuck your whole arm into the pizza oven and it burnt all the skin on your arm, we would say you have approximate 9% burn. If you stuck your head in there, you would have 9 for your head and 9 for your arm. 18% of your body would be burned. That's the rule of 9. So that's a summary of the three major concepts in this lesson. Tissues and how tissues form uh, organs to systems. An emphasis on this one body system, the integumentary system, and then homeostasis and how these different systems, especially in this case the integumentary system, how it works hard to maintain your body's internal environment. Homeostasis.